Mm -hmm. It's so exciting to be here. Um, I want to acknowledge that I look a little bit strange with this map. Um, people are used to these clear masks, but it's a way that I can continue to be COVID cautious while letting people who rely on lip reading uh, see my lips uh, and let people see my facial expressions. So you'll get used to it. My students get used to it, <laughs> you know, even though I get strange looks uh, from people seeing them for the first time. It's so exciting to be here uh, with all of you from Berkeley and my undergraduate advisor, Doug Charles, uh, who I did not know would be here. So um, this, is, this is pretty thrilling. Um, and so um, I'm he here to sort of give you uh, an advertisement or a proposal for my next big project because I would love uh, the feedback and suggestions and advice of uh, some of the amazing folks in this room uh, as I get started. So, How do I, there we go. Um, so nothing about us without us has been a common slogan of the disability rights movement for several decades. Uh, it invokes the ways that disabled people are often left out of decision-making processes that deeply affect us. We're so often spoken over by non-disabled experts, policymakers, caretakers, family members. And when things are said and done, about disabled people without our input, those words and actions rarely serve us. But archaeologists talk about disabled people without us all the time. When was the last time you heard a bioarchaeologist credit their consultations with modern people with similar bodies in their understanding of how an ancient person lived? I'm sure you've heard of archaeologists who study Indian residential schools, Japanese incarceration camps, or plantations collaborating with survivors or descendants. But what about when the oppressive institution under study is a lunatic asylum or a leper colony? Um, if we look at archaeological literature, we might easily come to the conclusion that disabled people were relatively rare in the past and do not exist at all today. But of course, that's not the case. Um, and in order to do a better job of portraying the complexities of past societies, we need crip archaeologies. Crip, like queer, is a slur that has been reclaimed by activists and scholars. Uh, in this room with Lori Wilkie here, I, I may not even need to explain this, but um, it has a sort of similar in-your-face political quality to queer. So you can think of Crip as the disability equivalent of queer. Um, and just as we need queer archaeologies in order to understand gender, sexuality, and normativities more broadly uh, in the human past, we need crip archaeologies to understand disability, health, and minds and bodies more generally. So today I will be exploring why archaeology needs to be crypt, why disabled communities need archaeologists to do this work, and my plans for a project that is about us, by us, and for us. Um, and I'm hoping to leave plenty of time for your questions, comments, and suggestions. So, as archaeologists, why do we need crip archaeologies? First, this work is part of making our profession more diverse and inclusive. So thanks to the hard work of activist archaeologists over the past 40 years, we know that archaeology is structured by patriarchy, heteronormativity, systemic racism. And these intersecting forces shape the demographics, practices, and knowledge production of archaeologists, leading to both the mistreatment of marginalized practitioners and the warping of the knowledge we present about the human past. Ableism also is part of this equation, structuring archaeology. What do we know about disabled archaeologists? In terms of quantitative data, there are very few statistics about how many archaeologists have disabilities. In fact, the only demographic survey of archaeologists that I know of that has included disability is are my own surveys. Um, no one else seems to be doing this. Um, but in a uh, recent study of uh, equity issues in uh, anthropological and archaeological funding uh, that was published on the Wonderground website, um, 1,114 1, respondents answered the question, do you have any disabilities, including physical, sensory, developmental, mental health, intellectual, and learning disabilities, as well as chronic health conditions? And as you'll see, both among anthropologists as a whole and among archaeologists, about one in four said yes which is actually sort of shockingly high um, to me. There are actually a, a lot of archaeologists. Um, there were some 
differences among subfields, but they weren't statistically significant. It was like across subfields, about one in four. Um, and the World Health Organization estimates that about 15% of people in the world have disabilities. So this is actually like quite high. Um, and I was surprised to see this because there's just been so little talk about disabled archeologists that like, really? One in four of us, really? Um, but it's actually quite exciting to think uh, how many disabled archeologist comrades I have. Um, my own research on disabled archeologists has shown that many of us are actually hiding in plain sight. So if that one in four seems so high to you because you look around and you're not seeing people in wheelchairs or using white canes or using ASL interpreters, the most common uh, disabilities among archeologists are not apparent or invisible disabilities. Uh, so a lot of learning disabilities, chronic health conditions, mental health disabilities, things like that are gonna be a lot more common because of the structural ableism of the discipline. Um, but managing the stress of negotiating or living without accommodations and keeping track of who does and doesn't know about one's disability uh, is really difficult. And it really weighs on a lot of archeologists, all of the stress around disclosure. That takes energy away from actually doing the work of archeology. span and archaeologists are not wrong to be concerned about stigma if we're open about our disabilities. Um, a recent British study of archaeologists with dyslexia showed that 37% of the respondents had experienced discrimination at work. Um, and so some of the issues that disabled archaeologists face are the same problems that our disabled comrades in other disciplines are dealing with. Um, disclosure, negotiating accommodations, working at the relentless pace of neoliberal academia, have all been discussed in scholarly literature on disabled academics experiences across all different fields of study. But archeology span has its own unique culture, much of which focuses around field work. I and many other scholars have emphasized that field work as a focus of disciplinary culture reinforces systemic sexism, classism, uh, exclusion of parents, um, and colonialist extractivist ways of uh, producing knowledge. But it's also a, because archeological sites are so inaccessible to so many disabled people. Not only are they rarely accessible to people with mobility related disabilities, but also they can be loud, bright, especially hot or cold or wet or dry, um, and are often far away from medical care. Although some archeologists, notably the late Teresa O'Mahony, who founded the Enabled Archeology span Foundation in the UK, have come up with ways to make sites more accessible to more people. And others have discussed in a recent publication in Advances in Archeological Practice about how to make, how to manage their chronic illnesses in the field. There are field sites that will probably always be inaccessible to at least some people. But when we treat field work as the only real archeology, span we're telling disabled people that they are not welcome. Even if some pretty basic accommodations would make a particular field site accessible to them, or even if they're doing fabulous work in the lab or the museum. The stigma of disability in the discipline where the physicality of field work is so prized means that disability is rarely discussed despite the large number of disabled archeologists. This silence makes building community, advocating for change, and explicitly drawing on our disabled embodied experiences to inform our research all very difficult. Furthermore, the exclusion of people with apparent disabilities um, means that disabled archeologists do not represent the vast diversity of the disability community as a whole. People with certain kinds of disability experience are mostly or entirely excluded from interpreting the archeological record. Despite all of these problems, disabled archeologists are persisting. We're building communities of solidarity and we're speaking up about our needs. The Enabled Archeology span Foundation is a UK based charity that seeks to quote, empower, enable and combat negative attitudes towards the involvement of disabled people in heritage, end quote. In 2021, I co-founded the Disabled Archeologist span Network. Uh, another co-founder is Katie Kinkoff who uh, came out of uh, this very school. Um, we are, quote, a coalition of disabled archeologists committed to providing an open and welcoming space to all disabled and disability questioning people. 
The BAN operates under the premise that disability is a social, political, and intersectional lived experience. We are building a community where disabled archaeologists can access an international network of fellow archaeologists in professional compliance and academic archaeology. All right. So as part of our work to diversify our discipline, we need to crip archaeology. But there are other reasons. Reason number two is to expand participation in public and collaborative archaeologies. So archaeologists increasingly collaborate with communities of stakeholders, often the descendants of those we're studying. Um, and alongside the development of collaborative and community-driven archaeologies that has largely taken place since NAGPRA, there's been an increasing emphasis on public archaeology and other forms of broad public outreach. Um, although a lot of this work uh, gained momentum after NAGPRA, uh, collaboration with descendants certainly happens far uh, outside of the borders of the United States and also within the United States with many, many uh, descendant communities other than Native American uh, tribes. And the communities that archaeologists collaborate with and the publics we do outreach to always include people with disabilities. Every community has people with disabilities in it. But the discourses I see about public and collaborative archaeologists rarely seem to focus on universal design, accommodations, accessibility concerns. I've seen archaeologists agitate, agitate for funding for their indigenous collaborators to come to the SAAs, but I've never heard of an archaeologist mentioning figuring out how to pay an ASL interpreter to include their deaf collaborator in all decision-making of their project, for example. The archaeologists who are leading the way on community-driven public archaeologies are doing amazing work, but that work may not be reaching the disabled members of those communities and publics that they're working with. Um, by developing uh, some best practices for universally designed community-driven and public archaeology that's accessible to all, I'll be able to help those archaeologists who aren't focused specifically on disability to have a wider reach within those communities. Some archaeologists are specifically studying people with disabilities in the past, and modern disabled people are stakeholders in that research. Although a lot of the archaeological research conducted by and with descendant communities is focused on direct or indirect ancestors of those communities, some archaeologists are thinking about descent and stakeholdership more broadly. For example, in this article, Sex Workers as Stakeholders, Incorporating Harm Reduction into Archaeological Practice, uh, Jennifer Lupu argues that regardless of their familial or cultural descent, modern sex workers are ethical stakeholders in the archaeology of sex work in the past. Their lives are affected by the stories that archaeologists are telling about the history of their profession, and they have an epistemic advantage in understanding the history of sex work. Therefore, modern sex workers should be consulted on and invited to collaborate in archaeology projects focused on past sex work, regardless of direct descendants. Analogously, modern people with disabilities are not necessarily descendants of people with disabilities in the past who archaeologists are studying, whether uh, we are specifically choosing to focus on disabled people or are talking about uh, broader communities than include disabled people in the past. In my case, the people I will be studying were placed in a eugenic institution that was explicitly structured to prevent them from having children so they don't have descendants. Most of them, it worked. Um, but they, they may have other living family and people with intellectual disabilities today who may or may not be related to the people who are in the institution I'm planning to study are ethical stakeholders in the stories about how people like them were institutionalized in past centuries. These stories shape the cultural construction of their disabilities, which affects their lives in the present. And people with disabilities should be collaborators in or ideally leaders of the archaeology of disability. Finally, we need crip archaeologies in order to improve our interpretations of people in the past. Just as every descendant and stakeholder community has disabled members, every ancient and historical community that archaeologists study had disabled members. As Berkeley's own uh, Margaret Conkey and Janet Spector taught us about gender, if we don't critically examine our gender biases and explicitly engage with feminist theory, we're likely to create and recreate androcentric interpretations of the past. 
Analogously, if we don't critically examine our disability-related biases and explicitly engage with disability studies, we're likely to create non-disabled-centric interpretations of the past. Disabled people in the present have a privileged understanding of how people in the past with similar body minds may have experienced the social structures that archaeologists are studying. Therefore, a more strongly objective archaeology in Sandra Harding's terms will incorporate disabled people and their perspectives into the research question design and the interpretation process. Although archaeology, archaeologists are increasingly doing this work with regard to gender, race, and ethnicity, we have a long way to go on disability. There are two main areas of archaeology where disability is a major subject of study. Bioarchaeology and the historical archaeology of institutions like hospitals, sanatoria, leprosaria, and asylums. In neither of these areas are modern disabled people commonly placed in leadership roles with regard to choosing research questions or interpreting the evidence. Only recently have archaeologists in these subfields even begun to engage with critical disability studies. And even path-breaking books like the Bioarchaeology of Impairment and Disability are several decades behind the curve of crypt theory and disability studies. Similarly, historical archaeologists studying hospitals, lunatic asylums, and other institutions for disabled people are rarely, if ever, collaborating with disabled people or drawing on the amazing theory coming out of MAD studies, critical disability studies, or the disability justice movement that would be so helpful in guiding interpretations. So I've talked about three reasons why archaeology needs to be crept. But do disabled people actually um, have any interest in what we're doing? Do they need to do us, us to do anything differently? Yes. Archaeologists may not be engaging with disability studies and disability rights and justice movements, but disability studies scholars and disabled activists are engaging with history, heritage, and the archaeological record, especially the history of institutionalization in the 19th and 20th centuries. The modern disability movement is often described as having started right here in Berkeley uh, with the advocacy of Ed Roberts and the other rolling quads. They were a group of students who were polio survivors with physical disabilities who advocated for their right to access higher education and live in the community. Roberts went on to found the Center for Independent Living. Now there are independent living centers all over the country, but the SIL is here in Berkeley. And independent living centers support disabled people in leaving institutions and finding the resources and supports they need to live in community and to advocate for their rights. Fighting institutionalization of disabled people has continued to be a core tenet of disability movements, even as many of the massive institutions of the 20th century have closed. Disabled people continue to be placed in nursing homes and other restrictive congregate care settings where they often have little control over their lives. ADAPT, a national grassroots direct action group, has fought for our homes, not nursing homes, among their many campaigns. The history of institutionalization continues to loom large over this movement. This work is happening on a broad scale, but it's also specifically happening in Massachusetts, where I'm starting my project. The national and local disability movements have focused a lot of energy on one particular institution, the Judge Rottenberg Center in Canton, Massachusetts, that's a suburb south of Boston. The JRC presents itself as, quote, a day and residential school. Since 1971, JRC has provided very effective education and treatment to both emotionally disturbed students with conduct, behavior, emotional, and or psychiatric problems, as, those, as well as those with intellectual disabilities or on the autism spectrum, end quote. Yet this so-called school uses a device to give residents electric shocks. This is not electroshock therapy. It's a disciplinary measure, an aversive to discourage behavior that the staff don't like. The residents who are considered likely to have problematic behaviors uh, wear devices against their skin, like you see right here, and the staff have remote controls that can deliver electric shocks to their bodies. The kinds of behaviors that caused this have included um, a case in 2002 when a student, Andres Serrano, was shocked 31 times in one day for the crime of refusing to take off his jacket when asked. So for several decades, disabled activists have been working to force the JRC to shut down or at least stop using these shock devices. And um, 
So this history of institutional abuse, it's not history in the disability movement. This is what we're working on. This is still happening. But disabled activists in Massachusetts have also been focusing their attention on the historical and archeological record of institutionalization in the state, although they don't use the phrase archeological record. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the Fernald Developmental Center in Waltham, Massachusetts. Waltham is another suburb of Boston to the west and a little north. Um, the Fernald was established in 1848 by Samuel Gridley Howe as the first public special education institution in America. It was originally called the Experimental School for Teaching and Training Idiotic Children. Idiotic was a medical term. Um, it was later renamed after Walter Fernald, a prominent eugenicist who was its director for the first quarter of the 20th century. The institution was the site of a variety of abuses, most sensationally in 1946 to 1953, Harvard and MIT scientists fed residents radioactive oatmeal to explore the effects of radiation on the human body without consent, of course. Um, the Fernald closed in 2014 and the land was sold by the state to the city of Waltham, um, which has let the campus crumble as it slowly considers possibilities for redevelopment. Disabled activists show up to every public meeting about the redevelopment, insisting that any plan include appropriate acknowledgement of the traumatic history of the place and must take a form that serves the disability community in some way. City officials have not been interested. In December 2020, the situation made the news when the city allowed the local Lions Club to hold a drive through Christmas light show on the grounds over disabled activists' strenuous objections. Both before and since the light show debacle, activists have focused attention on the Met Fern Cemetery, where people who died at the Fernald or the nearby Metropolitan State Hospital were buried. Their graves were marked only with a C for Catholic or a P for Protestant and a number, no names. One of my collaborators, Alex Green, pictured here, um, has been working for years to identify who was buried in which grave uh, so that family members and friends can visit and maintain the graves of their loved ones. The Medford Cemetery is easier for Alex and others to access than the campus itself because the campus is owned by the town of Waltham, which attempts to keep people out uh, while the cemetery is in a state park. Uh, incidentally, Alex is super excited about my work because he majored in anthropology at Brandeis, planned to be an archaeologist, but switched to being a journalist when archaeology was so ableist that he couldn't continue. One of the many cases of serendipity with my collaborators being interested in archaeology. Disabled activists, including Alex and several other collaborators, successfully lobbied the state government for the creation in 2023 of a special commission on state institutions. Mission has been slow to get itself organized, um, but has begun the work of figuring out where records from these institutions are, how to make them accessible to institutional survivors and their families as appropriate, where people are buried, who is buried where, and how the state should face up to this history. It's likely that this work will include remote sensing work at the Met Fern and other cemeteries associated with state institutions. Unfortunately, they have their work cut out for them uh, because this is what the records look like. Um, this expose uh, in the Boston Globe in January was actually written by the great-great-grandson of Walter Fernald, the eugenicist director of the Fernald, Fernald School. Uh, and he was able to demonstrate that documentary records, including private medical information of residents is just like, been left to blow around the site um, when it closed in 2014. Just everything was just left there. Um, people break in as a sort of adventure and go through people's private medical records and they are like scattered in the New England winter. Um, so uh, there have been a number of, these are just the most recent Boston Globe uh, headlines about this place. So this is a moment when disabled people and their allies in Massachusetts are super interested in the history and present of institutionalization of disabled people in the state. Many of the activists involved in this work want to make sure that the crumbling campuses of the defunct institutions are redeveloped in ways that both acknowledge painful history and serve disabled people in the present and future. And despite this headline about families of former patients and workers, um, 
the it's it's actually former residents as well and disabled people who are too young to have been institutionalized in these places. This headline doesn't uh, adequately represent even the article, which cites uh, several survivors doing this work. Um, I believe that this activist engagement with history and with the um, built environment of Massachusetts is a prime opportunity for archaeologists to contribute to the disability justice movement. So here's what I'm going to do about it. Um, I'm beginning to build a community-driven, disability justice-oriented, universally designed archaeology project at Belchertown State School in Western Massachusetts. The project is still in its earliest stages, so I'm going to tell you a bit about what I'm envisioning and then invite your questions and suggestions. I'll start with my site, Belchertown State School. Um, Located in Belchertown in Western Massachusetts, uh, Belchertown State School was part of the same system of state institutions for people with intellectual disabilities as the Fernald Center. The Fernald opened in 1848, um, but the expansion of eugenicist policies in the early 20th century led to the massive growth and the number of people being institutionalized. Um, the invention of IQ tests by scholars at my own illustrious institution of Stanford and others um, and the idea of intelligence as a fixed and measurable characteristic that could be used to define people as dull, morons, imbeciles, or idiots was part of this shift. And so the Fernals found itself overcrowded, leading to the opening of Rentham State School, also in Eastern Massachusetts in 1910, and then the opening of Belchertown in 1922 to serve the Western half of the state. Belchertown became the largest of the state institutions in terms of number of residents, and it was the town's largest employer by far. And the campus looked a bit like a college campus. There were brick buildings spread across landscape grounds with rolling New England hills in the distance. Um, it was built on the cottage plan. So there were, instead of one big building, there were many small buildings uh, sort of scattered across the campus. These structure, uh, some of the structures still stand, although others won't. Um, structures included dormitories for men and women, nurseries for youngest residents, a hospital for acute care, an infirmary, they called it, which was sort of a dormitory for people with uh, physical disabilities. Uh, industrial education buildings, kitchen, a laundry, a school, a power plant, a warehouse, and an administration building. There was also a farm where much of the food for the school was grown by farm boys who were adult male residents, who apparently lived relatively pleasant and free lives compared to their patri compatriots who were rarely outdoors or given anything to do. The institution was perpetually underfunded and understaffed, leading to terrible conditions for residents who were essentially warehoused in dormitories with little to do. There was terrible abuse, both interpersonal violence and structural neglect. These hor horrors were recounted in a series of exposés published in the Springfield Union newspaper in 1970 under the headline, The Tragedy of Belchertown. Around the same time, Ben Ricci, a physiology professor at UMass Amherst, whose oldest son was institutionalized at Belchertown, was persuaded to become the president of the Friends of Belchertown State School, a kind of parent-run booster club that fundraised for televisions, for the day halls, um, refurbishment of the carousel, uh, and sanitary necessities that were not being provided by the state. He began to investigate the conditions under which his son and thousands of others lived, and he was appalled. He went on to lead a class action lawsuit on behalf of his son, and the judge, Joseph El Toro, was similarly horrified and made it his mission in life to ensure that things improved for residents over the two decades until he could finally get ESS closed. The campus was sold by the state to the town of Belchertown and was added to the National Register of Historic Places. Some of the buildings have been used to house elementary school classrooms while a new school was being built. Um, seems to have been a strange episode uh, in the history, and to house community organizations, but a lot of them have fallen into disrepair or been demolished. And the site is being slowly redeveloped. There's a new assisted living facility for senior citizens and a preschool that have been built and opened on the site. The current development plan includes housing, businesses, and the refurbishment of the administration building as an archive and museum, thanks to the tireless advocacy of some of my collaborators. So why BSS? If the Fernald is making headlines, why am I now talking about Belchertown? The main reason is that this is a community that's more open than the community of Waltham to reckoning with this history. 
in Waltham, the town government uh, has basically decided to let the thing crumble rather than listening to disabled people about, about what we want. Um, and Rentham, the other in the triumvirate is actually still an institution. Uh, it's much, much smaller and much less abusive than it used to be, but it's not accessible. It's very, very securely sort of locked down. Um, but at Belchertown, there's this plan to make this, the, the administrative building into a museum about this history. Um, and that's because the um, friends of Belchertown State School that started as this booster club and then became the vehicle for a class action lawsuit has now become a historic preservation organization and I'm collaborating with them on the project. And so it's my hope that doing some of this work at Belchertown will persuade the municipal government of Waltham to be less committed to forgetting these histories. Eventually I could have a multi-sided project, but for now I wanna start in the place where there's already some interest. There are actually two previous projects that have grappled with the archeological heritage of Belchertown State School, either, even though none of them was great. Okay. Um, first, Belchertown also had a cemetery that also had stones marked only with numbers, no names. But a former resident, Albert Warner, devoted the, devoted the later years of his life to restoring the cemetery, creating a more fitting monument to those who had died there. So first he had this monument put up and then eventually uh, in 1994, he persuaded the state government to put granite stones with the names and dates of birth and death on every grave. Um, although the cemetery had been closed with the closure of the school, he and his wife Agnes, who are both survivors of the institution, got permission to be laid to rest there with their friends. The second project is the McPherson Garden, shown up here. Um, so George McPherson was the first superintendent of the school, overseeing it for his first two decades. He lived in the superintendent's residence, which was a fine house on a hill overlooking the campus, and he was an avid gardener. He grew this formal garden at his home. In 2022, a committee of volunteers refurbished the space as an accessible sensory garden. I admire their commitment to using the campus in ways that serve disabled people, but unfortunately, according to one of my collaborators in Belchertown, the committee was determined to name the garden after McPherson despite his eugenicist views. As that collaborator told me, everyone here has an Aunt Mary who worked at the school and she was a nice lady, so they don't wanna hear about eugenics. So it's clear that this town is in the process of starting to reckon with its past. And, and I'm hoping to build on the momentum of these projects to contribute to this reckoning. And this project will hopefully eventually lead to a monograph, but that will not be the first book about this place. There are actually six books about Belchertown State School that are already out in the world, although none of them are archeological at all. We have this, uh, this Girls and Boys of Belchertown, which is a fairly straightforward, not especially radical um, social history of the place. Um, my collaborator, Katherine Anderson, who leads the Friends of the Belchertown State School, did this Images of America book. And then there are four memoirs. Um, so these two, I raise my eyes to say yes, and you'll like it here are both by survivors of the institution um, who collaborated with co-authors in order to tell their stories. Um, neither of them actually had an intellectual disability. Uh, Ruth Sinkowitz Mercer had cerebral palsy and couldn't speak and was therefore, couldn't take an IQ test uh, in ways that could be recognized and was therefore deemed to be um, of low intelligence. Um, but, um, did not have an intellectual disability. And Donald Vitkiss was in the foster care system and just hated anyone in authority as a child and refused to answer the IQ test and was deemed of low intelligence. So we have these two people who were not who the institution was supposedly created for uh, who tell about the horrors. We don't have memoirs from people who today we would consider as having intellectual disabilities. We also have two uh, memoirs by sort of allies to the disabled community. Um, Howard Shane uh, was a, uh, is a speech therapist who he went on to work with Stephen Hawking on his uh, computerized voice, um, but he got his start as a 22 year old college grad taking the only teaching job he could find and getting sort of thrown into Belchertown State School. Um, and he was Ruth Sinkowitz Mercer's teacher and helped her develop a lot of the technology that allowed her to communicate with others and eventually write a book. 
And then we have the extremely bombastic Crimes Against Humanity, a Historical Perspective, which despite the title is a memoir of a single court case um, that is by the, that's by the father who led the class action lawsuit. And it's self-published and could use an editor, but it has a lot of really useful information in it um, about this history. So there are stories being told, but none of these stories are like directly the stories of the people with intellectual disabilities who are institutionalized there. And I think there's more, more stories to be told, building on all of these. Hence the archeology span project. And so it's important to me that this be community driven. Um, over the past year and a half, I've been in conversation with a number of state and local organizations. Um, Massachusetts Advocates Standing Strong is uh, the state organization of uh, self-advocates with intellectual disabilities. They have actually quite a long history of working with researchers studying people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and so I'll be applying for grant funding to work with them. Um, they set up focus groups to help researchers make sure that their research process and the results that they're presenting are accessible to people with intellectual disabilities. They've never worked with an archaeologist before, but they're very excited about that. They mostly work with like occupational therapists and speech therapists and doctors. Um, the Disability Policy Consortium, which coincidentally the executive director is the child of two archaeologists. I'm telling you, there's serendipity around this project. Um, and the Boston Center for Independent Living are two of the really important disability activist groups in uh, the um, in the Massachusetts advocacy scene, and they're both uh, pretty excited to be on board with this work. Of course, there's the Friends of the Belchertown State School, and then in another serendipitous move, the Belchertown Massachusetts Historical Commission includes an archaeologist who's um, actually a graduate student of Whitney Battle Baptiste at UMass Amherst, so she's uh, pretty excited to uh, see this happen and has talked to the rest of the Historical Commission on my behalf, um, and they're excited about having archaeology there. It's important to me that this project be built around the values of disability justice. Disability justice is not a synonym for disability rights. It's a movement led by disabled queer people of color, especially but not only those associated with Sins Invalid, which is an activist and performing arts project that's based here in Berkeley. Um, it's explicitly intersectional and a radical movement, and it's important to me to be led by these values. The 10 principles of disability justice developed by Sins and Valid have been explored in writings of various lengths, um, but they're most concisely presented in this image. And so intersectionality is the first principle. Um, I'm, I'm committed to intersectionality in all of my work, but the eugenicist history of the Belchertown State School makes it really important to me that I not lose track of racism and sexism um, and other intersecting forms of oppression that sort of came together in the eugenics movement. Um, you'll notice the second principle is leadership of, of those most impacted. Um, I'm disabled, but not the most impacted. Um, I don't have intellectual disabilities and I've never been institutionalized. Uh, had I been born in a different era, things might've happened differently with different medical interventions. And although I have lots of questions that interest me about Belchertown, I'm committed to soliciting collaboration with and input from Belchertown survivors, survivors of other institutions, and people with intellectual disabilities more broadly. The project will follow the research questions most of interest to them. Uh, like a lot of archaeologists who are collaborating with stakeholder communities, I see myself as bringing the archaeology skills and my time and energy to serve a marginalized community's agenda. Um, I'm happy to talk more about the, um, the other principles and how I see them applying. Thank you, Anna. I see this project as a space where people with all different kinds of disabilities, archaeologists and students and community members, will work together to do the archaeology of Belchertown State School. Uh, usually field projects are quite inaccessible to many people with disabilities, so I'll need to do things a little bit differently than the projects where I was taught to do archaeology. But luckily, I'm not the first person thinking about this. Uh, in education more broadly, we have Universal Design for Learning, UDL, um, and lots of other pedagogies that will be of use. Um, 
And within archaeology, we have veterans archaeology organizations like the American Veterans Archaeological Recovery leading the way on building accessible, accommodating, and humane field projects. I'm thrilled to learn from them. And in, the, in Europe, we have the UK-based Enabled Archaeology Foundation and the Netherlands-based Enabling Archaeology Group, uh, which have created a variety of resources for building inclusive projects where people with disabilities can thrive. I intend to draw on all of these and approach the project with the assumption that anyone interested in participating can and should contribute, and it is my job to figure out how to make the project accessible to them. So my next steps, um, this spring I'll be presenting at the SAA in a session on uh, theories of heritage. I'll be thinking through how bodies of theory around negative heritage, contested heritage, dark heritage uh, do or don't apply to sites like Belgertown. Um, I'll be taking a research trip to meet with my collaborators over the summer uh, and applying for NEH and Winter Grand Grants in the fall. Uh, then there will be a more uh, formal set of focus groups and interviews to develop my research questions, hopefully uh, followed by some actual archaeological work. And I don't know what my research questions will be yet, but there are a number of uh, ideas that I'm interested in pursuing if they align with those of my collaborators, just to give you a sense of the breadth of possibilities that I see at this site. So um, much of what's known about the history of the place is scattered in uh, across different books. Most of those books are from very small presses or self-published, not necessarily easy to get your hands on. They're in archives and they're in people's memories. So I'd like to create a digital map with pins at each location, linking to our, all of these different types of sources um, in different formats to be accessible uh, so that people walking through the campus today or from far away uh, can learn about the site. Um, there's this carousel. I mentioned the carousel earlier. All six of those books talk about the carousel. They all have a different take. I think it's that it was such a miserable place and there was so little for anyone to do that this carousel like stands out in people's memories. And I would love to write an object biography of it. Um, there's lots of drama around the carousel. <laughs> I won't go into all of it now. Um, there are utility tunnels that used to go under the whole site. It had its own power plant. And um, all of these histories and oral histories tell about um, residents sneaking off into the tunnels to do various illicit things. So I'd love to survey the tunnels that are still passable. Um, and I'd love to sort of think about the long durée of the site. There's a sort of layered history of land dispossession here where this is Nipmuc land. Um, and the Nipmuc were dispossessed of the land. Uh, several farmers were, so what became the farm of the state school was a poor farm for a while. Um, and then the state school took over and several farmers were sort of forced to sell their land. Um, so there's this layered history here uh, of this land being contested. Um, and also three layers of institution with the poor farm, the state school, and now there's an assisted living facility there. Uh, and so I would sort of love to look at those histories across that time and see what connections can be made across time. Oh, the other piece was that a different part of Belchertown uh, was actually taken by the state to build the Quabbin Reservoir. So there's uh, there's just so much, so many instances of land being taken away from people. Um, and so I'm I'm really I'd love to think longer about that. So this project might well include a typical archaeological excavation and lab work, but as you see, I have ideas for a variety of less invasive techniques and also uh, some sort of more eth ethnographic heritage. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Um, and I have some questions for you. What should I be reading? Who should I be talking to? What should I be keeping an eye out for? What questions do you have for me? I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to share this preview of my new project uh, in this community. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you um, as, I, as I shape it going forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so you'll be taking questions. We have some questions. Oh, yeah.
you look up great about and um, I was wondering like in terms of you sort of mentioned like these protocols in the Netherlands and the UK on how to make archaeology more accessible and um like what are how do you think like you'll find the people who will be working with you on this project your collaborators and do you have ideas about how you can like sort of more specific ideas about how some of these practices in archaeology can be made more accessible I'd just be curious to hear more about that yeah absolutely so I've already done a little bit of outreach through um, mass advocates standing strong and the friends of Ultratown State School which has a really good social media presence I made a uh, sort of flyer about who I am and what I want to do that um, with some help from the folks at Mass to make sure it was really clear and accessible. Get out of my ivory tower language and talk like a human being. Um, and uh, a number of people just already have reached out to me and expressed interest. So I sort of have a growing email list that way. Um, and I would intend to, through these organizations, continue to do that. So Mass in particular has um, region it's a statewide organization that has like regional organized communities that have regular meetings to talk about um, what they want to advocate for. And so I intend to continue like anytime there's news sort of sending it out through that network to make sure that's one of the best ways to get in touch with a lot of people with intellectual disabilities across the state who are interested in doing any kind of political advocacy. Um, I also am really interested in the possibility of working with students in the special education systems. Um, uh, Catherine Anderson, the uh, uh, president of the Belchertown Friends, is actually a special ed teacher. Um, and uh, Jill Beerley, the archaeologist working with Whitney Battle Baptiste, is uh, working on a dissertation at night. She has three children and is a special ed teacher and is working on a dissertation at night. So she's just a superhuman. Um, but uh, I have some connections to local uh, special ed communities through them that I would like to um, incorporate that. I'm having uh, sort of, uh, my little sister-in-law has Down syndrome and having witnessed her education, I can really see how she's not, she's rarely had access to social studies education because there's been so much focus on sort of independent living skills and literacy and numeracy to the exclusion of all else. And so I'd love to try to make sure that some of the students in special ed programs in the Belchertown area have some access to some history, especially history that's so relevant to their own well-being. Um, so one of the things that the Naval Archaeology Foundation and others have used is that their um, and American Veterans Archaeological Recovery too, is they have lists of different archaeology tasks that they circulate to participants before going into the field and have people tell them what which things they can definitely do, which things they might need some kind of accommodation or support to do, and which things they definitely can't. And I, I tend to think um, I've never been on a dig where every single person does every single task, so I'm not necessarily making that the goal. <laughs> um, usually those divisions of labor are like gendered and racialized rather than actually based on people's abilities and interests. Um, and so I think actually basing them on people's abilities and interests would uh, be a real improvement. Um, and so the idea is to really talk to people about what they're interested in doing, what they can do. And then um, there are a lot of, uh, disabled people are sort of shockingly uh, good at uh, coming up with ways to make things accessible to them. So if you, ever go on like an adapt action or a protest full of disabled people, someone's wheelchair will break down and then other people will have like tools and parts and stuff and figure out how to make it work. Um, there's a lot of, I, so I sort of intend to see collective access is one of the principles of disability justice. So I sort of, I wanna apply for grant funding to pay for accommodations that people need, but I also want to, um, sort of draw on the wisdom of the group and sort of not assume that things have to be done a certain way, but rather think about what people can do, what they wanna do and, and how to make things accessible. But there's a lot of, um, Teresa O'Mahony wrote this really amazing archeology span enabled archeology span guide that has things like, here's what kind of tape to use to tape a trowel to the hand of someone who doesn't have good grip strength without hurting their skin. Like, 
things like that. Here's how to dig a ramp down into a trench so someone who uses a wheelchair can um, can you know get into the trench. Uh, there are there are a lot of like sort of practical bits of wisdom like that um, in that guide, and so I'll certainly be drawing on that. I also will be learning from the American Veterans Archaeological Recovery. They work with occupational therapists and physical therapists to meet a lot of the veterans who go on their projects have um, injuries from their uh, time in the military and have to uh, learn new ways to move in their bodies to not injure themselves further. Uh, and so they work with OTs and PTs to help people figure out how to do that. Um, and then they also have a mental health counselor either on site or on call for the whole project, which is honestly something I could have used on some of my projects. <laughs> And I think like looking at this traumatic history, that kind of thing will also be really important. They also have a system of peer support where there are some of the more experienced participants are like get mental health first aid treatment and that, or training and then are like placed in charge of um, doing some emotional support for their peers. So I'll be drawing on a lot of those uh, kinds of things. Um, but I think also just working at a humane schedule with lots of breaks and making sure that people have the living situation they need and the food they need and the uh, access to medical care that they need. Most of which, um, in my experience as a field school student, it was basically on me to make sure I had that. And if I didn't, that was on me. <laughs> I don't know, it just wasn't seen as the, um, the job of the, of the project to take care of me as a human being in any way. And so I think just coming into it with that ethos of like, we're all going to work together. In terms of finding disabled archeologists, archeology span students to participate, the Disabled Archeologist Network, uh, we have about 120 people on our email list and many of them are happy to forward to their students. Also, just having been loud about this stuff for the last couple of years, people come up to me at conferences and are like, I have this student who uses a wheelchair. How do I take them to the field all the time? So I like, I feel like just my professional network is becoming a recruitment tool here just by being loud and being like, I want, it, I want your disabled students for my field school. I feel like they'll come. Uh, I have some faith in that. Yeah, Laurie. First, thank you for this. I'm really excited about this project. I love that you're talking about not just um, folks who are, who are tracked into this institution because of actual embodied experiences because of their body so the ways that these um, organizations become places to put people who don't fit expectations of society the way that um, there's been great work of, that i know you know in california looking at racialization of iq tests and and stanford you guys were complete not you yeah. but that institution was so key in setting up genic system of, of institutionalization from reform schools to sanitariums to insane asylums. I mean, and we don't talk about eugenics. We just don't talk about it. So the fact that you're developing a, a project that's going to allow that to come out and allow the, the people who were impacted, who will be impacted mm -hmm. because eugenics is surging again in this country. They're using different language. But it's the same old thing. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's really important and timely work at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, I had one question about your your survey, which I know is the first to have any. Were you able from your information to tease out age? Because one of the things that yes. we don't talk about in archaeology is is that it's a debilitating field mm -hmm. that because of these needs and, and concerns about people's well being have been ignored in the field. Archaeology hurts people. People yes. have, you know, chronic stress injuries and, and other kinds of things that manifest as, as we get older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is absolutely a debilitating field. And I was yeah. wondering if that's something that is, te is something you can tease out of your data. Yes. Uh, we did ask about age. Um, yeah. So the disability question was just a yes, no. Um, the survey was sent to members of 10 professional organizations mixture of archaeology and other subfields of anthropology. Um, and it got, yeah, over a thousand responses. And the the disability question was just yes, no. I would have loved more data, but like it was already a monster of a survey. So I settled for any data at all. 
Um, and then the age, I think, was broken into decades. Like, are you under 22? Are you in your 22 to 29? Are you 30 to 39, et cetera, uh, going up um, to, I think, like, over 80 was the uh, last one. And there were, disability did become more prevalent uh, among older people, uh, but we didn't ask anything about like the cause of disability. And so it's also true that older people in general are more likely to be disabled in general uh, because of many other debilitating uh, things in our world. Um, and I don't, I don't remember stats off the top of my head. I have no memory for numbers, only for stories. Uh, so, uh, but yes, that's certainly true. And yeah, I mean, I think a big responsibility of archaeological projects is to take care of people, um, especially when you're taking a bunch of academics who mostly live fairly sedentary lifestyles in temperate climates and then take them somewhere far away from home, um, far away from their normal medical providers, feed them a different diet, have them do a bunch of manual labor in a different climate with not enough sleep and too much alcohol usually. Um, like this has an effect on people's uh, mental and physical and emotional well-being, and I just think we don't we don't think about the occupational hazards of archaeology nearly enough. Um, and so, it would certainly be my goal to like really think closely about uh, about occupational safety. I'd also love to see more research about occupational safety in archaeology. I think where research should most be done is probably in CRM, and I have research academic archaeologists primarily, and occasionally CRM people tell me off and they're like, we're the majority, why aren't you talking about us? And I say, I have been in academia continuously my entire adult life. Do you really want me to come down out of my ivory tower and tell you what you're doing wrong? And they say, oh, no thanks. Uh, so I would love to see that work being done, but I don't feel like I'm the person to do it. Um, but yeah, I really think that this is a, we need to be thinking about this. There's been some interesting stuff in advances in archaeological practice lately about like chemical exposures and occupational safety. Uh, Mark Warner just published something about um, like chemical residue analysis and realizing that these sealed historic bottles actually contained toxic substances and maybe we shouldn't just like open them up to see what's inside without uh, taking any precautions. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank yeah. you for your talk. I really um, got a lot out of this and happy you're bringing this up. I think one of the things that really excited me was your discussion of of having veterans and what, what was an American Veterans Archaeological Recovery Group and kind of tacking on to, to Lori's discussion of how the field itself is disabling, as is the military, right? Certainly. Speaking of caustic substances and things, you know, I've yeah. got an uncle with seven forms of cancer, right? You know, yeah. from his time loading Agent Orange. But the idea that um, as a practice, I mean, going back to Augusta to now, right? <laughs> Veterans coming into archaeology, the systematic nature of it, the teamwork aspect of it, I've seen it heal vets, right? And yeah. so like like Project Nightingale and yeah. American Veteran Archaeological Recovery, I mean, they, they see this process. So, you know, the, the fit is great. But when you think about the things that that's carry right like ptsd yeah. i'm curious this this question has a point i promise it, when you get to the point of asking what your research direction is where those go um i'm just thinking and, I'm, and this is kind of a, a prompt asking those folks who have ptsd to help you see what's happening at these sites it can be transformative and thinking about how those research problems get generated through things like how one interacts with restricted view sheds, how one interacts with tight spaces or soundscapes, right? Mm -hmm. Veterans have this way of looking at those mm -hmm. things that they bring to a project that can completely, you know, I've seen it transform my work. I've mm -hmm. seen it transform the field work. And so I was thinking about how you might envision mm -hmm. that coming together for you and your research questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that there's just a lot to be learn from like most archaeologists are either neurotypical or can pass as neurotypical uh, or and have a lot of experience like masking any neurodivergent traits that they have but actually um so some of my interviews in my book uh, i had some a couple of autistic interviewees talk about how they felt that their 
while it was exhausting to like act normal all the time in professional settings uh, and to mask their autism um, or that they actually felt like they were able to see connections in their analysis and do a better job uh, at some of their archeological work because of their autism. I had two different people talk to me about that. And so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I just don't know of any archeologists with intellectual disabilities. I just, we're archeologists, you have, you have to get a college degree and colleges with programs for people with intellectual disabilities don't usually have archeology span programs related to that. It's like either not the same colleges or it's not the same program. Um, but I really think that both talking to survivors of institutions about what their experiences were and talking to people with sort of similar neurodivergent uh, characters, like ways of seeing the world um, about how, how what the place looks like to them, I think is um, just as relevant as thinking about what this place looks like to me um in terms of understanding what it was like and so i expect it's gonna be really hard i think this is a project that's going to bring up people's trauma and i definitely i'm going to be extending invitations to participate but certainly no pressure for anyone who is you know dealing with trauma of having been institutionalized they don't want to come no pressure like my your well-being is more important than my archaeology pretty much for everyone everyone's well-being is more important than my archaeology and but inviting conversations and I and I think that um I'm gonna be wanting to set aside a lot of the sort of machismo of professional archaeology where only certain emotions are allowed to be expressed like we can like if we all if we need to like cry together about this history we're gonna cry together about this history I expect to cry um I have cried in in the process of this and I can get up here and give a professional talk but um yeah, like this is going to be an emotional, an emotional archaeology as well as a, a physical one. And so just trying to create a space where like that kind of vulnerability is welcome. Um, and I have some experience with that in my teaching. Um, my, I, I taught a class at Stanford in the fall on archaeology and disability that um, my students sort of commented on how it felt like a safe space to be vulnerable. Um, none of them had apparent disabilities coming in, but like, whoop, turned out almost all of us were disabled and um, sort of by being willing to be vulnerable myself and, and sort of, but also holding everyone to a high, um, high bar of respect and care for each other. Um, yeah, I think that like we can, we can sort of deal with these difficult subjects. And I think that honestly, just having a real diverse range of people with all different body minds working together, we're actually going to understand this place a lot better than if we all either were or are, were pretending to be uh, neurotypical and non-disabled. There's a question behind you, Sarah. Thank you so much for your talk. I wanted to touch mm -hmm. institution. There is this around urban exploration and uh, which has its own cheese most you're encouraging people to find these sites oftentimes state institutions explore them which leads to defacement and other sort of interactions I know that was absolutely the case um, that was abandoned and it was sort of like a rite of passage for people to go and like invade this space. Um, I was just interested primarily um, if you have plans to sort of engage in from an archeological perspective and the sort of the material that these so-called urban explorers leave behind. And then also to, if you hope change to the way we view these types of state institutions, treatment that we give other archaeological sites or sites of past trauma. Yeah. Yeah, so on my last visit to Belser Town, I and Kate from the Friends Organization and Jill from the Historical Commission and a police, uh, we went with a police officer uh, who, one of the buildings is now used to like house his office. He's the canine officer and the, there's no good place for the dogs at the main police office. This place is, the layers of history of this place are very strange. Um, but we were able to get permission to go inside some of the buildings. And I was 
shocked by how much Nazi graffiti there was all over this place. Like so many swastikas, but also uh, other like racist symbolism of various kinds. Um, and man, I would love to dig into that because like, yeah, this was a eugenicist institution. This was like the kind of place that the Nazis were learning from. So it's actually very uh, fitting that it's covered with swastikas now or ironic. I can't quite figure out which, both. Um, and I, I'm not sure that the people who are leaving, I, I would love to know, like not so much to get people in trouble or anything, not from any sort of carceral perspective, but just like, who are you? Why are you doing this? Like, what does this feel fun? Does this feel transgressive? Like, do you think of yourself as a Nazi? Like, if so, do you identify with McPherson? Because he was sure into making the race better by not letting certain people reproduce, you know, at that time. So like, what, why here? Is this just like where there are abandoned buildings that you can draw swastikas on? Like, what, what is that? What, what, tell me, tell me what that is. Um, I do, however, I really think that I need to, I need to follow the interests of the people, um, yeah, the people most affected. And so we'll see if that ends up being part of it. But I also, I imagine that as these relationships grow, I'm hoping that I'm gonna be working on this project for a long time and there will just be opportunities for a variety of different routes um, that, you know, different people, it, it's not like every, intellect, every person with an intellectual disability in Massachusetts is gonna be interested in the same things anyway. Like we're gonna end up with sort of multiple research questions, but the, the role of this place as a crumbling institution to be explored is also of interest to me. There's also, there's this, there was this person who was a resident at Belchertown who was accused of a murder that he almost certainly couldn't have committed. There was a whole court case about it, but he like supposedly ran away through the tunnels. There's this whole like urban legend about this like murder that's also laid on top of this place that, um, gets sensationalized, you know, um, and, and adds to this like allure of, of this place. And yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting as, especially as it gets redeveloped, um, to see sort of which, which buildings like get to stay and which don't, which get refurbished and which get torn down and sort of how that history stays or doesn't. But I would love to sort of take that interest and like, oh, you're interested in this because it's a crumbling institution and that's cool and creepy. Like, well, let's actually learn about it. So the same way for intro archeology span students, I'm like, you think pyramids are cool? Let's talk about labor. And here's what the people who built Giza ate. You know, like uh, I, I, I tend to like to take that sensational stuff and use it as a hook to share actual information. Um, you don't want to go too far in that way, in that direction. Like if you get too sensationalist yourself, you contribute to the problem, but I'm certainly not opposed to like using a little bit of that as advertising to then share um, more sort of thoughtful uh, takes on the place. Well, I'm afraid that we- Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.